Here are the same fireworks from a safe distance of about 25 kilometers, as seen by a conspiracy theorist scumbag. All the video speed tricks and superimposed captions are his work, not mine. I call him a scumbag because, in the time it took him to do those editing tricks, plenty of close-up videos had appeared online showing the smoky reality of the display, but he insisted on publishing his deceitful claims anyway. Before I consider the main topic of this video, I need to clarify a few concepts related to truth and falsehood. First, I do not look like this. I am deceiving you about my appearance. A fact is an accurate description of something real. For example, it is a fact that one penny plus two pennies equals threepence. However, things change, so claims which are facts when they are first stated may later become incorrect. Since this book was published early in the 20th century, all the collieries mentioned have closed down and the road has been improved. Proof is something real which confirms the accuracy of a claimed fact. The existence of my copy of the road book I just referred to is proof that such a book existed, but the existence of this image of the book is not quite proof. Instead, it is only evidence. Proof is an aspect of evidence, but evidence is not necessarily proof. My copies of these books are proof that the books exist, but these photos are not. The subtitle of The Secret Country is evidence, but not proof, that Mysterious Britain sold well enough to justify a sequel. There could be other reasons why the sequel was published. The fact that I have these books in my library is evidence that I have been interested for quite a while in esoteric knowledge, and these books are evidence that I have also had a long interest in speculation about oppression by thought control, and these are evidence of my interest in conspiracies, and so on. From all that evidence you can form a hypothesis about my knowledge of the matters I will be discussing in this video. You also need to know something about my attitude to those matters, so I will state now that, whatever my general opinion, I will be accepting, for discussion purposes, that esoteric and occult phenomena exist. In that spirit, here is a hypothesis about the summer of 2012. That season began with rainfall in quantities remarkable even by British standards, and it continued rainy for weeks and weeks. A quieter period in late summer was followed by another major drenching. Conveniently, that quiet period began with the public rehearsals for the London 2012 Olympic opening ceremony and continued through the Paralympics. One odd feature of the rainfall is the pattern between the Olympics and Paralympics, highlighted here in green. If you compare it with the period after the Paralympics, you see the same pattern in the same time frame. A rise, followed by a fall almost to zero, then a higher rise, abruptly halted just in time for the Paralympics, but soaring to a high peak when all the games were done. Equally odd is the pattern on the day of the Olympic opening ceremony. These images show stadium spectators sheltering from the rain just a few minutes before the official 9pm start of the ceremony, as they had on several occasions since the stadium gates were opened at 5pm. But there was no rain during the ceremony itself, only thick cloud which enhanced the lighting effects in the stadium. That combination of widespread changes, some lasting weeks and some timed within minutes, quite unlike the chemical techniques used for the Beijing 2008 Olympics, enables us to form the hypothesis that magical weather mongers exist in Britain. The odd rebound pattern after the Olympics and Paralympics suggests that such tampering with nature is not to be undertaken lightly and cannot be sustained for long. A hypothesis is not a theory. All relevant evidence will tend to support a theory, and the theory will be able to indicate what other relevant evidence might be found in future. The paradoxical thing about a theory is that the most important aspect of its definition is the possibility of finding proof that it is wrong. 
we will never be able to prove that supernaturally gifted weathermongers did not work to ensure the success of London 2012, so my hypothesis cannot be a theory. Evolution by natural selection, on the other hand, is a theory. Some people do not understand what counts as proof that evolutionary theory might be wrong. The absence of intermediate examples in the evolution of some natural wonder proves only that we have not found any examples, not that no examples ever existed. On the other hand, the discovery of a fossilised, fully evolved serpent in the oldest rocks ever found would be a serious point against evolution and for creationism. That brings us to our next relevant word, falsehood. Here is a picture of Barnard Castle, as it was about the time the road book I mentioned earlier was published. So, the picture is false because it's out of date, but it's also false because it is not in full colour. There's no intent to deceive, but that doesn't alter the fact that the picture is not really telling us the truth. It's not a lie, though. A lie does intend to deceive. And if we look closer, we'll see that this picture does also contain at least one genuine lie. Those clouds are not clouds. They are painted onto the photograph to liven up what would otherwise be a plain grey sky. In full colour it would probably have been a glorious blue, but without that colour the publishers decided a lie was acceptable. Lying is easy. For example, it takes very little work to turn the title page image from the Road Book of England into the title page for a Road Book of Scotland. The image is still evidence, but it is not evidence of the existence of the book. However, this picture does not lie, so it is evidence of the existence of the book, but you can see that the difference between evidence and proof is very important. Speaking of Barnard Castle, here's an old saying which has become unexpectedly well known in Britain in 2020. The road from Durham to Barnard Castle was the one government adviser Dominic Cummings chose to drive along with his family during the coronavirus lockdown, allegedly to test his eyesight. Given that Mr Cummings is Durham born and bred, we can form the hypothesis that he is aware of the saying and chose his destination specifically for the opportunity to put it into practice. Sadly though, actually proving anything about what a person is thinking is beyond current technology. Now I am going to criticise a young man who cannot respond. But the reason why he cannot respond may be a result of his own sudden understanding back in mid-June 2008 that he might have made a terrible mistake. The best I can do is avoid naming him, but as this video progresses from comedy to tragedy, I hope you'll understand why I think such retrospective criticism is necessary. Having for some time been interested in the esoteric, he was inspired to research the symbolism and occult connections of the upcoming 2012 London Olympic Games after attending a lecture at the 2007 Glastonbury Festival, to which I will refer later. In the spring of 2008, he published his findings as entries in a blog, and I'd like to start by examining the most amusing of these blog posts. Please note this is not a comprehensive analysis, there's plenty more in the blog to waste your time on. The blog is overloaded with falsehoods, but my hypothesis is that they are errors, not lies. To explore this further, we need to add another relevant word to our list. Misinterpretation. One important way to avoid misinterpretation is to make sure you consider all the available evidence. If you catch yourself ignoring or failing to mention evidence which does not support your hypothesis, stop, take a deep breath and examine it closely. One entire blog entry is devoted to a coin issued in 2004 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first sub four minute mile run. The blogger's claim is that the small hand on the stopwatch points to 20, as in 20 minutes past an hour, and the large hand to 12 o'clock, i.e. 2012. He fudges over the official explanation that it shows the time of the run, three minutes, 59.4 seconds. Stopwatches for timing medium distance runs do not have our hands, Indeed, most of them do not concern themselves with hours at all. Instead, they have a small hand to show minutes and the large hand sweeping the full face to show seconds. Hence, in the case of the watch shown on the coin, the hand on the small dial is not pointing to just before 20 past, but to just before four minutes on a 12 minute dial. And the hand on the large dial is not pointing to just before 12 o'clock, but to just before 60 seconds. Oops. There's one major catch with that entirely true explanation. The watch shown on the coin is nothing like the real stopwatches used to time the run in 1954. 
On those, the small dial was marked with 60 half minutes, which could time world records in longer races up to 10,000 metres, and to enhance accuracy, the hand on the large dial made one sweep every 30 seconds, not 60. Subconsciously mistaking the time of 3 minutes 59.4 seconds for 2012 on these watches would be impossible, as you can see in this close-up. Conspiracy spotters like to use a term predictive programming, referring to a sort of softening up process by which people are prepared in advance to accept some change planned for the future. Although the conspiracy allegations tend to misrepresent how the process works, the principle is real, and this coin is, very probably, an example. The UK government had announced its support for a 2012 Olympic bid on 15th May 2003, so the 2004 coin would have been designed with the potential for a London 2012 Olympics in mind. At that stage, the people they were most keen to influence would be the residents of East London and, of course, the International Olympic Committee. But every little helps and many more hints and promotional tricks followed, not just in the run-up to the award of the host city contract, but during the development of the Olympic facilities and, some seven years later, during the final run-up to the Games, including the torch relay which millions around the nation could experience in real life for a few memorable minutes. It is very true that there are different types of prediction. Making a prediction about something beyond your control but not beyond your understanding, such as an eclipse, is not the same as making a prediction about something you have arranged yourself, like a public holiday. Be very wary of making claims after an event which you personally did not expect, that it was secretly planned like a public holiday, and that hints were made in advance to soften you up. That has been happening a lot in 2020 with coronavirus, and some people have frankly lost their minds just a bit. Compare, for example, the claim made in this YouTube comment on the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony with the image it purports to describe. I have not altered the numbers on the car license plate. The commenter was just so obsessed that his brain refused to recognise the truth. That's a step beyond simply ignoring evidence, which he also did by failing to consider both the hint in the title and the appearance of a famous Tim with the initials TBL at the end of the same scene. In marketing, the term predictive programming refers to a different technique, using data gathered through cookies, browsing histories, etc. to predict what individuals will respond to and when they will be most receptive, then program their personalised adverts accordingly. What the conspiracy spotters are describing, on the other hand, is most closely related to one small aspect of a strategy called nudge marketing. As that name and the examples I have given suggest, nudge marketing works by presenting people with multiple small hints over a period of time. Sometimes, bizarrely, the predictive aspect of nudge marketing can be applied repeatedly, with variations in each cycle of repetition. Here, for example, is a late incarnation of the starry eye which would be broadcast for a few seconds without any caption or commentary at various times in the early run-up to a series of Celebrity Big Brother in the UK, not followed by more informative promotion until a week or two later. One famous piece of nudge marketing associated with the Olympics was the parachute jump by James Bond and Queen Elizabeth II during the 2012 opening ceremony in London. Later in the ceremony, viewers on commercial channels were treated to a trailer for the film Skyfall. That was several months before the release date, but long nudge marketing campaigns are standard practice for the film industry, starting with teasers such as photos taken on set and including elements like a song from the end credits, interviews with cast members and the director, exclusive looks behind the scenes, and so on and so forth. Now to the blog entries about the local streets and a gentle start to a long, ridiculously complicated analysis. The bloggers claim that the site was claimed to be the last area of suitable wasteland in London is a regrettable oversimplification of a claim which was already regrettably oversimplified. The Olympic site did indeed include heavily polluted wasteland and landfill sites, but it also included thriving industrial and commercial sites, dozens of relatively modern homes, lovingly tended allotments, a nature reserve, and much else. The catch was that they were all mixed together, which meant that there was little point creating any really attractive new facility in the area if other buildings on the same street looked ready to collapse, so the whole area was devalued. 
The only realistic solution was compulsory purchase of all the separate properties to be redeveloped at once, but that needed an unusual level of legal justification. Making an Olympic park is one of the few legally acceptable reasons for compulsory purchase of a mixture of bad and good properties. Without the Games, the local authorities would have been tied up for decades in negotiations with property owners. The blogger claims you will find that the entire site of the Olympic Village is surrounded by somewhat biblical and mystical road names, and he provides this map as evidence. So here's problem two. Anybody who knows the area will spot that the red haze, claimed to indicate the Olympic site, is in the wrong place. That's mostly the site of Westfield Stratford Shopping Centre and the Stratford International Station on the high-speed rail line to the Channel Tunnel both of which were developed on the site of a massive railway depot which had become redundant. However, the high-speed rail link is the true key to understanding why local authorities wanted to redevelop the area as quickly as possible. That station is not viable as a stop for high-speed trains to Europe unless the surrounding area is full of people who want to make the trip on a fairly frequent basis. These photos I took five years after the Olympics are proof to me, though not necessarily to you, that an Olympic park covered a large area adjacent to the blogger's pink haze. If you were to visit the spot where I stood back in 2017 and see the sort of signs my photo shows, featuring the words Olympic Park, that would prove to you that the location of the stadium, contrary to the blogger's map, is within the park. To see the whole of the new development, we're going to need a bigger map but then we need to reassess the mystical names which no longer surround the site. A brief detour on the topic of surrounding the site, the blogger notes gleefully that the notorious blue fence which protected the area during development was 11 miles long. It's difficult to measure, and this diagram misses quite a lot of fencing along railway tracks and such like. If it was more like 10.5 miles, would that invalidate the neat numerology? Returning to the mystical names, I'm going to answer a question. The blogger asks, what's the likelihood that, of all roads, the A, quote, 20, unquote, 12, intersects the Olympic site? And the answer to that is rather beautiful. The British road number system is as logical as it can be, given that it is based on routes which have evolved over thousands of years. From London, radiate five major roads to important ports, numbered clockwise, A1 to A5, with the A6 branching off the A1 in Hertfordshire. If we now look more closely at the sector between the A1 and A2, we find some roads with two-digit numbers, also radiating clockwise, A10 to A13. It was more or less inevitable that the A12 would pass very close to an Olympic park located along the river which used to mark the eastern boundary of London. However, the history of the A12 tells us more, because it did not originally run to the Blackwall Tunnel. The blogger is interested in the section of the A12 called the East Cross Route because of the religious significance of the cross. The site marked on his map is misleading because it's just the north end of a longer route which goes south to the Blackwall Tunnel. The East Cross Route, opened in the 1970s, was designed to cross the old radiating roads and once you know that, you will not be surprised to learn that it was preceded by a West Cross Route on the opposite side of London. Plans for a North Cross Route and a South Cross Route were eventually abandoned in favour of creating the M25. The blogger's East Cross Route explanation, like almost everything else he publishes, is a hypothesis, not a theory. All available evidence except for the word cross indicates that the name has nothing to do with any type of Christian cross, but it will never be possible to provide proof that nobody secretly influenced the name to fulfil a hidden occult purpose. There is another beautiful truth to be understood here. The reason why such a large area of problematic land is east of London, not west. In Britain, the wind most commonly blows from the southwest towards the northeast. Therefore, as a matter of town planning logic, activities which generate noxious gases and smells need to be sited in the northeast quadrant of the urban area, as far from the centre as possible. The River Lee was the boundary of Middlesex, the county in which London and its northern suburbs stood, so even hundreds of years ago, unpleasant industries of the sort which the proposed Olympic Park was intended to remove were required to site themselves along the Lower Lee Valley. Next name, next problems. Leighton, 
which the blogger associates with ley lines, those alignments of ancient sites first tentatively identified in the 1920s as prehistoric predecessors to the straight Roman roads, which have since been linked with flows of earth energies. The first problem with this suggestion is that the 1920s researcher Alfred Watkins ignored important negative evidence when he suggested that the word lay was linked with prehistoric alignments. We know hundreds of Britain's ancient Roman place names, many of which simply added Latin elements to original native names. Syllables similar to lay are very rarely found, yet they suddenly become superabundant in post-Roman names. Leighton itself is referred to in the Doomsday Book, compiled in 1086. In fact, it is mentioned several times because it was split between multiple large landholders. The representatives of the different landholders supplied the Doomsday Surveyors with two subtly different spellings of the name, L-E-I-T-U-N-A and the more common L-E-I-N-T-U-N-A. One of the entries without the extra N was an estate belonging to Westminster Abbey, Monasteries were very zealous in maintaining records of their property acquisitions, and Westminster Abbey was no exception. Although some details in their records seem to have been falsified, probably to minimise connections with individuals who had made themselves unpopular with the Norman conquerors, the document preserves what's almost certainly a genuine pre-1066 spelling of the place name, L-Y-G-E-T-U-N. Leighton is a town on the River Lee, and the River Lee was not just the border of Middlesex. About the year 885, it became the official boundary between King Alfred's territory of Wessex and the land controlled by the Vikings. In the treaty, the name was spelled L-I-G-A-N, and a few years later, in late summer 895 or 896, when a band of Vikings rode up the river and began interfering with the harvest in Hertfordshire, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle used the spelling L-Y-G-A-N. A very early Chronicle entry for the year 571 refers to attacks on places north of London, including Limbury at the main source of the River Lee, which was spelled L-Y-G-E-A-N-B-Y-R-I-G. It should be noted that the Old English pronunciation of the letter G in these words would be very, very soft, almost like modern Y in yarn or yellow whereas the old Y would be closer to the modern Y at the end of words like holy. The early spelling variations imply that Leighton was named after the River Lee, and that the river name is very old indeed, almost certainly learned by the Saxons from the earlier Celtic inhabitants of the area. One possibility is that it is named after the Celtic god of manual skills, Lug, who also appears as a character in Welsh legend, Llechlau Guffus. The suggestion that the River Lee is named after the god Luke is most unlikely to be proved either wrong or right, because whoever named the river has been dead for a very long time. Other examples, like the Thames, Severn and Trent, suggest that the name was given long before the Romans introduced writing to Britain. It is supported by evidence, in the sense that all early forms of the name contain a soft G, but that makes it a hypothesis, not a theory. By the way, Leighton Stone is simply the part of Leighton which was near an ancient stone, now represented by the High Stone, just north of the village. As a postscript to the place name shown on his map, the blogger adds Church Road in Leighton, noting that the road on the northeast perimeter of the complex takes its name from the Christian place of worship, a church. Well, duh. That is, of course, absolutely a fact, but it is also a sort of misinterpretation. For hundreds of years, every parish in England has had at least one church, and, as you can see from this copy of a map dated 1721, the church on Church Road was there before the road. Similarly, the ancient church of West Ham Parish is on Church Street, just southeast of the Olympic Park. In linking the nearest one of thousands of parish churches to a mystical notion about the Olympic Park, I think the blogger was deceiving himself. Amusingly, however, he missed a religious place name which would quite neatly replace both Church Road and the invalidated East Cross route. The lands along the Lee Valley in both Leighton and Hackney used to be treated as commons, their primary function being winter pasture. They were opened up for grazing at Lammas, a Christian conversion of an ancient Celtic harvest festival celebrated on 1st August, amended to 12th August in the British calendar adjustment of 1752, so they became known as the Lammas Lands. 
The Temple Mills were located in both Hackney and Leighton as the mill stream was the county boundary. The blog reference to Temple Mills Lane, the access route to the mills, correctly states that they belonged to the Knights Templar, to whom the site was donated in 1185 by William de Hastings. However, the Knights Templar own many, many pieces of real estate, so these Temple Mills are nothing special. You may like to know, by the way, that the former inn on the river just northwest of the Temple Mills, in what became a coach park for the 2012 Olympics, was often known as the White House. Lots of conspiracy potential in that, if you're so inclined. Next in our wander round the incorrect Olympic Park boundary is Angel Lane. This road, now seriously cut up by modern developments, originally led north from Broadway, Stratford's main street, turning off by the former Angel Inn, now demolished. There had been an Angel Inn in the Stratford area since at least the 17th century, so it is likely that the road was named after the hostelry, not the other way round. In the days when few could read, Angel was a popular sign for inns and public houses because everybody would be familiar with pictures of angels in church. The first post office directory for Essex, published in 1855, lists angels at Stratford, West Ham, Waltham Abbey, Ilford, Romford, Dunmo, Witham, Stanway, Kelvedon, Holstead, Harwich, Chelmsford and Colchester. Great Eastern Road obeys similar rules to the East Cross route, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's Great Western Railway led west from London. Later, the main railway north from London was named the Great Northern Railway, and the main railway east was named the Great Eastern Railway. The disused railway land on which the Westfield Stratford Shopping Centre was built used to be the major maintenance and storage centre for the Great Eastern. Finally then, Carpenter's Road. Joseph, stepfather of Jesus, was not the only carpenter who ever existed. In fact, there were so many of them that, even just within England, they banded together for purposes of training and mutual support. The Worshipful Company of Carpenters still exists in 2020, and in 1767 it bought an estate in the Lee Valley, southwest of Stratford, to provide an income for its charitable activities. That's the last religious name in the blog, but the true boundaries of the real Olympic Park can give us a few more, along the A11. Close to the park's southern transport hub, Abbey Lane leads south of Stratford High Street to the site of the former Cistercian Abbey of Stratford Langthorne, sometimes called West Ham Abbey. The route from London to Colchester originally crossed the River Lee at the Old Ford, but in the year 1110, Matilda, Queen of England, ordered the building of a bridge with a causeway across the adjoining marshes, which became Stratford High Street. The bow shape of the new bridge gave a name Bow Road to the new road which replaced the Roman road to the old ford, but the bridge itself was dedicated to St Catherine, and the other main bridges on the causeway, across other channels of the River Lee, were dedicated to St Michael and St Thomas of Acre. To be fair, that really is a largest number of religious names, so what's going on? St Thomas provides the clue, because the bridge named after him is near to a mill which belonged to an order of knights associated with the Templars, who named themselves after St Thomas of Becket and the fortress of Acre on the Mediterranean coast north of Jerusalem. Like the carpenter's estate, the mill, locally just known as the pudding mill, was intended to help finance welfare activities. The economic resources of the Lower Lee Valley were basically water power and marshy land which grew bountiful crops of grass. Neither was exactly a shortcut to wealth, but with good long-term management they would not lose money. As a result, wealthy landowners who owned other properties which required much less effort would offer their more challenging land holdings to charitable institutions like the Cistercian Order of Monks, the Templars and the Carpenters Company, which were accustomed to long-term, high-efficiency investing. For example, here is an ancient estate, now the site of the Orbit Tower, which provided income to fund the maintenance of London Bridge. That network of channels was developed over several centuries to drain the marshes and maximise the water supply to the mills along the causeway. By the way, King Alfred's channel to strand the Vikings at Hartford was almost certainly dug in the wide valley near Stansted Abbots, not at Stratford. So our blogger was right to call attention to the high number of religious place names associated with the Olympic Park site, but wrong about most of the names he cited, and apparently ignorant of others. 
I have presented a hypothesis and evidence to explain the local abundance of such names, but, as usual, there is no reason why somebody else cannot claim that, regardless of their origin, the religious connections were the hidden true reason for choosing this site for the games. When introducing the Carpenter's Company, I mischievously superimposed images of a lighting tower from the Olympic Stadium on the three sets of compasses in the company arms. Here are the lighting towers in situ before the stadium was redesigned to accommodate football. As this December 2007 image indicates, they were actually a late amendment to the original design, apparently because it was felt that raising the lights higher above roof level would minimise glare in the eyes of the stadium spectators. Those triangular towers drove conspiracy seekers absolutely wild. Despite the clear fact that they were just triangles of metal tubing with a bunch of lights at the apex, people associated them with a well-known meme of the eye in the pyramid. Pyramids are very, very solid. Triangles of metal tubing are not. But of course any three-dimensional structure can be represented on a flat surface, and the eye and pyramid design is depicted on one of the world's most popular sheets of paper, the US dollar bill. That image is based on the official heraldic specification for the reverse side of the Great Seal of the United States, as defined in 1782, so let's consider the elements of that specification. A pyramid, unfinished. In the zenith, an eye and a triangle. Zenith is a heraldic term indicating that something is shown as if it is high in the sky. Surrounded with a glory proper. A glory is a depiction of light radiating from somewhere. Proper means that if shown in colour, it should be as you might expect to see it in nature. Over the eye, these words, annuit coeptis, which is Latin for, he has approved our undertakings. On the base of the pyramid, the numerical letters MDCCLXXVI, which is 1776, indicating the year of the Declaration of Independence. And underneath, the following motto, Novus Ordo Seclorum, which is Latin meaning a new order of the ages. Please note that seclorum in this phrase can only mean long spans of time. It cannot, for example, be translated as secular or of the world. A mildly interesting detail. Although the dollar shows the unfinished pyramid with 13 courses of stonework to indicate the 13 states, that number is not mentioned in the heraldic specification. In theory, the Great Seal could be redesigned with added stones every time a new state joins the Union. Conspiracy spotters associate the whole design with Freemasonry, everybody's second favourite long-term cabal of schemers, but there is no need to make such a link. Both the Freemasons and the Founding Fathers of the USA respected the Egyptian pyramids for their inherent strength and endurance. They also came from Christian backgrounds and were conscious of the notion of God as the Holy Trinity. The inherent structural stability of the triangle has significance to Freemasons, and the eye in the triangle is a clear representation of God for all Trinitarian Christians, as seen in these European examples. That symbol is a development of a far older concept, expressed in what is known as the Athanasian Creed, after the 4th century Christian philosopher who formulated a basic description of the nature of the Trinity. The triangular visual aid for the Athanasian Creed can be used point upwards or point downwards, as sometimes depicted on knight shields. The iron triangle version seems to have been developed to help teach people who could not read and in its point upwards version it lends itself naturally to being placed at the zenith of an image streaming glorious light from on high. For our blogger, pyramids indicate power hierarchies and ultimately the creation of a new world order, as not quite mentioned in the US Great Seal. He was delighted to find support for his belief in the unlikely setting of the British driving licence, as modernised in June 2007. The security hologram supposedly showed a car steering wheel with the road ahead in perspective beyond and the glow of sunrise on the horizon, but it could be interpreted as an eye in a pyramid with a glory like the one on the US dollar. Amusingly, the next update of the license in 2014 made the road look less like a pyramid but made the steering wheel look more like an eye. Somebody in the Department of Transport seems to have a mischievous sense of humour or maybe there really was some higher purpose behind the design. 
Once the games had been awarded to London in 2005, a very strange problem had to be confronted. The year 2012 had, decades earlier, been calculated as the end of a long cycle in the ancient calendar system of the Mayan civilization, and there were competing claims that it either marked the beginning of a whole new era or the end of the world. Given that the Olympics, as one of the world's greatest events, were a focus for very extreme attention-seeking, that would be a distinctly scary prospect for the 2012 organisers. I am now going to present my own very dodgy hypothesis about the ways the London 2012 organisers dealt with that problem. Or rather, I will in a minute, after I have once again castigated the blogger for lazy and frankly insensitive research. 5,000 years is not precisely the length of our current cycle in the Mayan calendar because the Maya were very sophisticated in their time calculations. I'll ignore the dubious basis of the original 1980s claim by Jose Argeas about the significance of the 13th of Aktun and just focus on why precisely is not the right word in this context. The real figure is 1,872,000 days, which would be about 5,126 standard years, not precisely 5,000. Now back to the Olympic effort to deal with the 2012 prophecy. They could not change the year. They could not change the Mayan calendar or people's beliefs about it. They could, however, turn the prophecy from a liability to an asset a weapon for seeking out the sort of attention-seeking scumbags who might have both the will and the resources to cause a world-shattering event in 2012. Since the 1990s, Britain has possessed one world-class, though prudently non-violent, attention-seeking scumbag in the form of ex-BBC broadcaster David Icke. He made a very successful second career out of wild claims about power conspiracies, the ingenious backbone of this system was the argument that the world's ruling classes are secretly Illuminati reptilian aliens. And of course the real leaders of it all had to be Jewish Illuminati reptilian aliens. For Ike, the early 20th century Russian hoax document called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was a legitimate and vital text. I think the Olympic organisers studied Ike's work and the online responses to it as part of their efforts to build a profile of likely threats to the 2012 Olympics. And I think that quite quickly somebody spotted what happens when you knock over the last digit of 2012. It was very likely that some follower of Ike would eventually take advantage of that and rearrange the numbers to spell Zion. Once the London organisers understood that, the way forward would be clear. Followers of Ike must be positively encouraged to rearrange the numbers to spell Zion, just as followers of the Mayan prophecy must be encouraged to associate the Olympics with the mystical year 2012. That could be done through the design of the London Olympic logo. The original logo for London's bid to host the Olympics in 2004-5 had been another piece of nudge marketing using the distinctive meander of the River Thames where it meets the River Lee as a symbol for the city of which people would be reminded whenever they saw a map of London. For the main logo, to be used once the bid had succeeded, the location became irrelevant. It was all about the year. Angular figures, not vertically oriented, would emphasise the ambiguity between 2, Z and N. Arranging them in a square rather than a line would encourage rearrangement to spell Zion. But just to help, a totally meaningless extra blob could be added to the design, ostensibly increasing the number of graphic elements to 5 matching the Olympic rings, but in practice encouraging people to convert the figure 1 to a letter I. The extra blob would also be a key element in the essential task of hiding the fact that the logo had been deliberately designed to attract the attention of unhinged people. Other obvious ambiguities had been included so that the organisers could claim the interpretations were all in the imagination of the viewer. For example, once you see Lisa in the design, kneeling down in front of somebody, you can't unsee her. The security budget for the 2012 Olympics was very large and somewhat open-ended, potentially augmented by international cooperation. It would easily suffice to monitor all internet forums for references to the ambiguities in the London 2012 Olympic logo or to the topics raised by those ambiguities and to compile contact chains for everybody who took part in those discussions. 
The logo was revealed to the public at the beginning of June 2007, almost exactly the same time as the strange new design for the driving licence, leaving more than five years for all that tracking and tracing of people with an interest in world-changing events. One of the first significant figures to take the bait was Ian Crane, who had established himself as an alternative thinker and speaker at events like the Glastonbury Festival. His talk at Glastonbury 2007, titled Fool Me Once, added his observations about the new Olympic logo and the New Jerusalem to a David Icke-style rumination on global conspiracies. This is the British Israelis, those who believe that the UK is the lost tribe of Ephraim and that the New Jerusalem, the New World Order, will be established. And my conjecture is that I'm not sure which will come first or maybe they'll come together. But there will be an event at the London Olympics. They're starting with a blank sheet of paper. Crane's reference to the British Israelites is quite cunning because one of the most famous things about that particular little religious sect is that much as they want to be, they are not Jewish. Among Crane's audience was our unfortunate and impressionable blogger who chose to treat the non-esoteric interpretations of the Olympic logo as all ridiculous diversions. He was inspired to find out more about the designers and his blog includes a short biography of the firm's co-founder Wally Ollins who had left the firm back in 2001 when it was taken over by an American multinational and would thus have had nothing to do with the Olympic logo. The blog makes casual mention of Wally's ancestry but pays much more attention to the revelation that he was a Freemason. Remember the Peterborough Saxon Chronicle with its references to the River Lee? It continued to be written in English long after the Norman Conquest and its description of the lawless state of England during the reign of King Stephen in the 12th century is famous. Among the events described is a deeply disturbing incident in Norwich in the year 1144 in which a boy was brutally murdered after visiting the home of one of the town's small Jewish population. Although the local sheriff found insufficient evidence to charge anybody with the crime, the local monastery took up the case and campaigned for the boy to be made a saint. A monk who arrived a few years after the incident made detailed investigations, interviewing every witness he could find, and eventually published a book about the murder. Gradually, more and more churches across England began reporting deaths of children which they connected with local Jews. Early in the 13th century, the tale took a further twist when another boy in Norwich was kidnapped, definitely by Jews, and circumcised. That story also grew over the years into an allegation that he was being prepared for ritual crucifixion. In case you're wondering, the key to that story is almost certainly the person who is never mentioned, the boy's mother, who seems to have died before the incident happened. The father, a Christian, was a doctor, which is a profession associated with Jews from ancient times, so it seems likely that he was trained by a Jewish doctor and married his teacher's daughter on the understanding that their children would belong to the Jewish faith. Between those two Norwich stories we get all the ingredients for an anti-Jewish trope which continued over centuries and became known as the blood accusation, or, given the lack of real evidence, as the blood libel. As you can see in this encyclopedia article, the blood libel was used to provoke much of the mob violence against Jews which, in the 19th century, became a spur for movements to encourage the formation of a Jewish state, or at least Jewish migration to the Holy Land, which was then an underpopulated, underdeveloped region of the Ottoman Empire. The common name for such movements was Zionism. Meanwhile, the blood libel has evolved in recent decades, thanks in part to a thoughtless piece of writing by Hunter S. Thompson. The false claim that adrenochrome has to be harvested from human beings is a pseudo-scientific modern version of the blood libel, applied not just to Jews, but to anybody conspicuously successful, which is handy if you want to give the impression that you're not anti-Jewish. The whole New World Order, or elite conspiracy notion, works along the same lines, Old anti-Jewish claims expanded to include successful non-Jewish figures like Bill Gates and Hillary Clinton. Meanwhile, back with the symbolism. 
the blogger links the New Jerusalem interpretation of the Olympic logo to a poem written about 1804 by esoteric writer and artist William Blake, which is not based on either Jewish tradition or the racism of the British Israelites, but on the recognition of Jerusalem as an archetypal holy place, combined with a claim that Jesus visited Britain in his youth with the wealthy merchant Joseph of Arimathea. This poem had been set to music early in the 20th century and had become an unofficial anthem for England. Possibly it was this very blog entry which encouraged Danny Boyle and his team to place the anthem and its vision of a spiritual new Jerusalem for everyone front and centre in the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony. One of the blog's recurring themes, as I have previously hinted, is numerology. I won't say much about the references to the number 11, except to remind you that, whatever the number base system you use, octal, decimal, hexadecimal, or any other, if you use a Hindo-Arabic system of aligned columns to write the numbers, the number obtained by adding 1 to the base will always have special properties. It's not the number which is special, but the writing system. Also, as I've already mentioned, the blogger's habit of adding 20 in front of any occurrence of the number 12 is really irritating. The bloggers claim that numerologically significant days of the year entertain events controlled by the governing powers is quite reasonable, but it skates over the possibility that those significant days might be chosen by anybody who wants to make an event memorable. Hence the section on the numerology surrounding the 9-11 terrorist attacks in 2001 should not have ignored the obvious connotation for Americans that 911 is the number to phone the emergency services. He mentions the time and date for the start of the 2008 Beijing Olympics, 8 minutes past 8pm on the 8th day of the 8th month of 2008, but he fails to consider the specific significance of that to Chinese people, who associate the number 8 with luck and prosperity. I'll return later to this cultural aspect of the blogger's tendency to ignore evidence which does not strengthen his arguments. Funnily enough, special significance is not even simply a cultural thing. Compare the blogger's obsession with number 11 with the attitude of Illuminatus author Robert Anton Wilson to the number 23. There's also quite a lot of cherry-picking in the section on previous Olympics. For example, the observations about the UFO which landed as part of the Los Angeles 1984 closing ceremony fail to consider that 1984 was within the great science fiction movie boom which began with Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Wars brackets, no episode number, close brackets, and had continued triumphantly through 1983's Return of the Jedi and beyond. Similarly, the claim that the 1972 Munich Olympics were host to the first official global terrorist attack ignores the much deadlier Palestinian attack on a Swiss airliner in 1970, among others. The Munich atrocity was just easy to spot when researching the Olympics. Racism is not just about the physical appearance of people. A large part of it would more accurately be labelled culturism, a tendency to view different cultures through the distorting lens of your own culture. Our blogger's habit of ignoring evidence which does not support his ideas inevitably leads to a lot of culturism, as we have seen in his ignorance of Chinese number symbolism and can also see in his assessment of the 2008 Beijing Olympic logo. Until quite recently, the rulers of territories needed to occupy the high ground, placing their strongholds on the peak of steep hills. In Chinese pictographic writing from 3,000 years ago, you can see that the symbol for the ruler's stronghold is a building on a hill. Over many centuries, that symbol developed into this modern character signifying a capital. The word Beijing means northern capital, as opposed to Nanjing, former southern capital of imperial China. Now that Beijing is the sole capital city for the nation, it is commonly known just as Jing, the sound represented in Mandarin by this character. Chinese characters have strayed so far from their pictorial origins that calligraphers can modify them artistically without changing their meanings. For example, here is the Jing character turned into a dancing figure. One context in which characters are routinely altered for artistic effect is the design of seals, typically used to print signatures, ownership marks, etc., with a red paste. Hence, the 2008 Olympic logo was a dancing jing, as it might appear when printed with a seal stamp. But does our blogger care about 3,000 years of Chinese tradition? No, because he believes that he has spotted a familiar word hidden in its various curves, 
including another all-seeing eye. A more subtle cultural blindness is seen in his discussion of the five Fuwa mascots for the games, in the colours of the Olympic symbol. He correctly observes that one mascot is orange, but fails to notice that it is rather more orange than the equivalent Olympic ring, which is officially described as yellow. As you can see here, the Olympic ring is a very orangey yellow, but the mascot goes a stage further, from Pantone colour 137 to the darker Pantone 144. In fact, all the yellow hues used in the Beijing Olympics are very earthy, not flower yellows, and there's a cultural reason for that. Bright yellow was the imperial colour, now associated not just with the emperors, but also to an extent with decadence and immorality. Symbolism is not international, except when it is designed to be. The blog was being compiled during the torch relay for the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games, and on 21st June, summer solstice, the flame was due to reach Lhasa in Tibet. Given that the sun was pictured on the flag of the former independent Tibetan state, shining at the top of a neatly triangular snow-covered Himalayan mountain, the blogger judged that it symbolically represents the same belief system as the all-seeing eye on the American dollar bill. Replace an eye for a sun and a pyramid for a mountain, and you will see that we are dealing with the same agenda, where all roads lead to worship of the sun. Buddhists are very much not sun worshippers to the best of my knowledge, though I'm happy to be corrected. Given that this element of the Tibetan flag was a 20th century concoction, it is true that there may be a connection with the design on the Great Seal of the USA, but not an esoteric one. The official significance of the sun on the flag is freedom, and there may have been a hope of winning US support by echoing a design fundamental to Americans' concept of their own nationhood. Continuing the sun worship theme, the blogger shows this image of the Dalai Lama with the flag's sun symbol directly behind his head, and this image of an earlier Dalai Lama with what appears to be a sunrise disc behind his head. But look at these other images of historic Dalai Lamas, who also have discs behind their heads in very unsolar colours. What we're seeing is more like the Tibetan Buddhist equivalent of a halo, a signification of holiness. And that was what the modern photo was trying to echo by placing the current Dalai Lama in front of the flag. Also, in referring to the exiled Dalai Lama, the blogger states, It becomes apparent that the last spiritual hope in the world still abides to a pyramidal power structure, which shows a desperately limited understanding of the spiritual. Extending a comparison of the character of the Tibetan snow lion and the western unicorn to focus on the equivalence of the latter's horn to a third eye is a classic case of focusing solely on aspects of the evidence which support the blogger's claims. The suggestion that Buddhism's three supreme jewels could also be interpreted as the Trinity is an insult to both Buddhism and Christianity as the spiritual concepts referred to are united only by a quantity. He adds, after further discoveries of the number 11, that we mustn't forget that the Olympic torch symbolises our veiled moon goddess Isis, as seen here starring as the Statue of Liberty. Utter nonsense. First, the Olympic flame was dedicated to the Greek goddess of domesticated fire, Hestia. Second, the Statue of Liberty is what it claims to be, la liberté éclairant le monde, the Roman goddess Libertas lighting up the world. By the way, spot the bonus Tibetan flag connection. Wandering further down this path, he contemplates the Columbia Pictures logo of a woman holding aloft a torch. The clue to what's going on here is the name of the company. Columbia was one of the original names proposed for the United States, and the logo, the first version of which appeared in 1926, was a deliberate attempt to cash in on the popularity of the Statue of Liberty. The rather unradiant appearance of the torch in the first version may be related to the accompanying slogan, enabling the company to claim that the image did not show a torch but a gem, just in case the design of the Statue of Liberty was covered by copyright. The old cultural insensitivity surfaces again in discussion of chakras, again linked by the blogger to utterly unrelated Christian concepts which happen to involve the quantity seven. This links to an earlier blog entry about the official observations page of the British passport, which, before the age of microchips, featured a rather startling picture of plants. His claim that this image means nothing to Joe Public was arrogant and foolish, for the plants were the Rose of England, the Thistle of Scotland, the Daffodil of Wales and the Shamrock of Ireland, two of each except for the Shamrock, thanks to partition. 
referring to the heraldic roses which have been depicted with five petals and five stamens since the middle ages his first thought of course is to join the stamens to make a five-pointed symbol of satan he also asks why is there a random number eleven on this page which makes him look even more stupid because on the preceding page are captions numbered one to ten they are provided for the benefit of customs officials whose first language is neither english nor french and they refer to an index in twenty-three different languages which would of course have been significant to robert anton wilson the chakras however he perceives down the centre line of the symmetrical plant pattern and i suspect that he is partly correct for the shamrock has been neatly placed where its upper petal can represent a heart and needless to say the plant's root is exactly where a root or a root chakra ought to be the significance of any symbol can be complex and changeable consider for example the philfot once upon a time it was a reversed germanic equivalent of the eastern symbol called a swastika but over the course of the twentieth century its meaning was modified at first quite subtly note in this nineteen twenties revision of the early twentieth century harmsworth encyclopedia article the specific suggestion that the philfot is lucky its reversed oriental equivalent evil the name swastika is now incorrectly used for the philfot perhaps in an attempt to distance the symbol from british culture in germany it was known as the hackenkreutz hooked cross after the second world war the hackenkreutz was so inextricably linked with the evils of nazism that it was banned in some countries and few today think of it as an innocent symbol of good fortune there are more subtle ways to ruin innocence though on twelfth june two thousand and eight our blogger posted an entry on the significance of the letter x and in particular the use of three x's together first a bit of numerology not involving elevens on this occasion and only slightly spoiled by the detail that the position of x as the twenty-fourth letter of the alphabet is surprisingly recent as this practice by a tenth-century student shows yes x did originate from the greek letter chi but only because latin did not need a k sound but didn't want to use the fiddly greek letter for the x sound and yes chi is the twenty-second letter of the greek alphabet but declaring that as eleven eleven means every eleventh number is special here comes the cultural insensitivity again quite spectacularly the chinese symbol for life force is indeed commonly spelled the same in english as the greek letter chi but this is absolutely the only link and to suggest that the greek letter was the origin of the chinese is outrageous first the pronunciation is different not like chi but chi or qi second neither modern nor traditional characters for that concept look anything like an x as usual this chinese character has pictorial origins in fact two separate pictograms representing different aspects of sustenance here's a sheaf of grain stalks representing food and at right some wispy clouds representing the atmosphere that we breathe but the blogger ploughs on to the coup de grace the two thousand and twelve olympics were the games of the thirtieth olympiad x x x in the roman numerals preferred by the international olympic committee the blogger proceeded to list all sorts of occurrences of xxx and concluded that it was a tool for the harvesting of emotional energy which would be used to maximum effect in twenty twelve one particular example of the emotional connection of xxx attracted questions over the next day or two its use in correspondence i think that the claim attracted more than questions and somebody suggested the blogger's understanding of symbol magic was dangerously mistaken we have seen in the different notions of significant numbers the meaning of colours the tale of the philfot slash hackenkreutz slash swastika and so on that belief is important to the power of symbols the idea that people's energy can be harvested through a symbol without their knowledge does not fit well with that apparent fact about the way occult powers work worse anybody who believes that idea must believe that all occurrences of x x x are dangerous however much love and goodness went into making them in effect the blogger was making people believe that good things are bad and thus he was increasing the amount of evil in the world
Whether or not that was the reason, on 14th June 2008, the blogger had a crisis, the least terrible effect of which was that he erased his entire blog. Unfortunately, some of his followers refused to believe that he had done that willingly, so they salvaged as much of the blog as possible from their browser caches and re-uploaded it. When he protested, they were not convinced that the person sending the messages was really the blogger. Gradually, more and more of the blog was revived, in multiple copies. The blogger had lost control of the evil he had created with the best of intentions, and it was spreading wider and wider. There was absolutely nothing he could do. Nothing.